This is episode 170 of the Phil Swallow podcast. Uh, the show is entitled Where to Go Next and uh, recording it on YouTube Live on Monday the 8th of April 2024, Eclipse Day in the, well, the US, Mexico kind of area. Uh, I didn't realise that when I when I scheduled this, I kind of just do it every three weeks. So uh, yes, this is the usual thing where we have a chat. Well, I have a chat, you chat in the box, and I kind of update on a few things that have been going on, uh, things that have happened, things that I'm working on, things that I'm working on now, things that are going to happen in the future. So, uh, as usual, I love it when you guys get involved, so uh, feel free to, to, to tap anything into the chat box as we go. And I know often people join this a little bit later, so uh, it's, it's open, people can respond as and when they like. Uh, it's a kind of friendly forum so uh videos that have gone live well i put uh i put one out for review this was an interview that i did so i'm waiting for some potential comments back on that and then that will go live looking forward to that going live the save sandstead library appeal that was just something that uh i had a chat with richard per city from the sandstead residents association who's been working on the appeal uh, because it's it's misguided, really. I mean, they they said Library in particular has get, got some very good kind of use use figures. I don't know what you call them, you know, book loans and stuff like that, but other activities as well. And there was a consultation today that I wasn't able to get to. But uh, yes, it's just about people filling in a survey making a noise contacting their mp and councillors and all that kind of stuff but i just i thought the best way i could do something would be to put a video together and it was only a short one uh, just with a big kind of splash say safe side said library and shortly after that i did my country walk for the month of march so that was titsy airstrip which i think i'd i'm pretty certain i normally mention these things more than once and uh that i don't know if i've mentioned this I might have alluded to it. It it didn't end up as I expected. Now, when Titsy is open, the house is open, you can park in quite a generous car park with an overflow near where the cafe area is and the gardens. You can pay your money and either have a, have a walk around the gardens or go into the house. It doesn't open till May, May till September. And there is literally a handful of parking spaces that are available 24-7 uh, further or nearer to the main road if you like where you where you enter into the estate i went along there hopeful that i'd get a parking spot because i'd worked out a walk from that parking spot from the actual titsy car park 24 7 and it didn't work uh i got there and it was there was already a car turning around coming out he said no chance so so i went back parts in limpsfield village uh, took out the Ordnance Survey Maps app that I use for plotting all these walks, or the, certainly all the country walks, and uh, I reworked a route. And it worked okay. I was kind of happy with it. Um, the weather was nice. Um, I, I achieved the objective of getting to Titsy Airstrip. But it was a bit hairy going along the... Uh, now, it's is it Lipsfield Road? It's not Lipsfield Road. It's Titsy Road. Uh, Lipsfield Road feeds into Titsy Road. And uh, yes, it was a bit hairy. And I, as I mentioned in the video, I'd bought some of these kind of luminous things that you can tie onto your backpack and arms and stuff like that. Think kids when they're going to school when they're about seven or eight. Anyway, uh, those kind of things. And uh, and I, I didn't have them with me. It would have helped a little bit, even if it made me feel a little bit more safe. But went along to the airstrip and and actually, probably should have checked it before, but after getting back and putting the video together, there was a reference made on Google that it was uh, closed, or is, it, is that what they say on there? No longer in use or something like that. But it, the way it words it, it's not clear who actually said that, so whether it's done on assumption. So um, I, I, I don't know. Uh, it... it it certainly didn't look like in use in the winter because with the weather we've been having, if a plane came down and they put any weight on it, it would probably sink. So I'd like to think that there is some potential for use there at some point, but it was a really nice walk anyway. And this kind of feeds into something about the title of the podcast, about where I might go next. Because the original intention for that video 
was to at least get a, an eyeball, a fix on a Roman villa site that is in the grounds of Titsy Place. And the map just says site of Roman villa, very generic. Uh, but if you go online, you can see under Surrey Archaeology where they've done dig a dig there. But actually in the 1990s, they found another kind of mirror Roman villa site on the other side of the stream that kind of connects the two. And it, it would make sense to have a uh, property like that, properties like that near the stream. Uh, they'd done some geophysics and some test pits, found enough evidence to be confident in what it was there. So that was cool. And lo and behold, when I started digging deeper on the map even more, I saw that up Clackett Lane, so why have we heard of Clackett Lane? Because of Clackett Lane services on the M25, which the walk went quite near to that. But on Clackett Lane itself, if you're going up the lane, so this is towards climbing the hill towards Westrum area, on the left, and I don't know if it's marked, but there was a Romano temple, Roman temple uh, site there. So uh, what's the other term? It's Romano something anyway. But there was a Roman temple there. So clearly there was uh, a fairly active community there in Roman times. And they've found coins and all that sort of stuff over the um, over the years. And there's also more, I think, more activity taking place up at Chaldon. I mentioned I think I said Causden in the last podcast, so I'll correct it now. Chaldon, Chaldon Court, behind Chaldon Church. They're doing some uh, archaeology activity there, which uh, I might get involved in through the Bourne Society. So so that was really one of the things about where I might go next. It's partly not, well, physically where I might go. Yes, there's always a number of different locations. There's always different things at different levels of research. But I'm actually thinking about exploring some of these archaeological archaeological locations because we've got so many of them in the area you know we've got i called out one in the recent walk the botley hill walk there was a, a kind of bronze age enclosure i'm going to do another walk in another two walks possibly in the chelsham area weather permitting uh but that's probably going to be the country walk for this month and uh, i've also got plans to do catrum asap and to do Godston, I've been doing some prepping for that based on an old Bourne Society book. There's way more to Godston that, than I ever realised. I don't know why. I'd never bothered to look in detail on a map. But there's a lot of ponds and kind of water features, a lot of history. So Godston will feature in a walk and talk at some point. Uh, may go down there and just do a recce and stay on the dry stuff for now and then see about adding in the, the kind of woodland elements after that. So that's what's live at the moment. So there's two, as I say, there's like the short appeal video, uh, the Limpsfield to Titsy airstrip walk, and that area, rich in history, and will get a revisit. I'm looking to kind of, that that probably would be more fun in the summer, to be honest. Not just generally, but the whole sweeping landscapes and all that kind of thing. Uh, and I may do some walks in the evenings as well, pick out some of the late, late twilight and stuff. Um, one other one that, will no doubt feature uh, I, I went along to Kenley Aerodrome on Easter Sunday and there was a dedication of a maple tree that was planted because it's a hundred years now that the Royal Canadian Air Force have been formed and they had uh, a gentleman from there a colonel from the Canadian Air Force and a kind of uh, a general party and a, a minister there to do a, a short service but it was a really nice uh, event uh, I, I, I didn't really take any camera gear uh, my iphone i used and i took a number of pictures shared them on the site and lo and behold a couple popped up popped up in the inside croydon uh, website but at least they credited me photos by phil swallow never never spoke to me never approached me um but they were just you know recording the event unfurling the flag and pinning things to the tree and the little sign it's all very nice but on the back of that linda who organized it brilliantly linda duffield she said to me about doing a video because they've done a number of different uh, update, updated information boards, of which they got many, and they're brilliant up at Kenley site. Uh, we're going to do a kind of follow-up to the video that I made with them in late 21, early 22, and pick out some of those sites. So a bit more of a dedication to the, they're calling it hashtag RCAF100, um, because there was a very, very big Canadian uh, contingent at Kenley during World War II. Actually, one of the things I asked Linda when I got there was, uh, was there any chance of a fly past on 
while they were there, while we were there having the service. And she said it was a bit frustrating because in the Battle of Britain heritage hangar at Biggin Hill, they had a Spitfire flight planned between 12 and 2, and we were there at 1. And it was a Canadian Spitfire that they were going to fly, but it had a predetermined flight plan that they weren't prepared to change. So it's a bit, I, I get it, but it's a bit frustrating they couldn't just do a little arc around Kenley, but uh, that's the way things are. But it would have been really cool. So that was cool. Um, and there will be a video uh, Ke- at Kenley at some point, probably sooner rather than later. The nice thing about that site is you can kind of stick on tarmac. You don't really need to go wandering off piece there, but it's a brilliant site. Uh, I kind of kicked myself that for years I never really spent much time there. Uh, but it's had a lot of work done to it to bring the information to light since the millennium, since I got some funding for Kenley Revival. Um, and it's just it's a nice place for just exercise, fresh air. People cycle around it, jog around it. Uh, sunsets up there are brilliant. So um, are you looking forward to doing that? That'll be a bit of a revisit. That'll be one of the places I may go next. Uh, just a quick update on stats. So March, 7,098 views. 668 watch hours and 44 new subscribers. So the numbers were down a little bit, but I mean, that doesn't bother me unduly. Uh, it, it, like a lot of these things, they throw all sorts of numbers at you. Um, I, I'm not going to change what I do just if the numbers are doing a certain thing. Um, I know that some videos will always perform more than others, have more engagement, typically central Croyd and stuff like that. But, uh, I, these are the things I like to do. I mean, I would go for a walk anyway. I just take a camera. Um, I would explore towns, but I just take a camera. So that's that's kind of in essence what I'm doing on the on the channel. What I did do was clear out a couple of old videos. Now, the reasoning for this was that they related to, actually they related to a couple of rants that I'd had. Uh, one was about Shell and their provision of an electric car charger because they didn't do a very good job at all. And I complained and then they actually responded to the YouTube video and they since fixed it. But it, time's moved on from that. That was well over a year ago. Um, and I think if I put a kind of uh, a clickbait style title, massive fail or whatever, which I think I had in the uh, on the thumbnail, it kind of it's misleading. It doesn't do them any favours. And I'd rather take it down now than them ask me to take it down. So uh, so that's that's gone. And the other one was about Virgin Media uh, because there was a major issue that I had with a, a previous iteration of one of their routers. And it had quite a bit of traction, quite a lot of views, had some subs, uh, subscribers on the back of it. But I just thought, again, it's moved on. They could quite rightly say to me, look, we've got no issues with these anymore. So I thought, well, I'll do it now. I'll be proactive. So I've, I've cleared out a couple of those videos, and I think four in all. Um, and I I might do some stuff by moving or creating some new travel videos on a separate YouTube channel because I've never really done, I did dabble with one on Tokyo, but we had a brilliant holiday uh, getting on for a year ago over to Japan uh, where we did a cruise with Cunard and we saw all the sites around, well, Japan, some of the sites, you can't see all the sites, and we dipped into uh, South Korea and then we came back, had three nights in Tokyo. Brilliant holiday, one of those kind of holidays of a lifetime, but I've got all the footage. Um, a, a lot of it is 360, so I can frame it how I want to. But I kind of think this channel is kind of... A lot of kinders tonight. This channel has is set now, I think, where I want it to be uh, at the level, the type of content that people would expect to see. Uh, so if I just threw in... Uh, oh, look, here's a Cunard cruise around Japan and South Korea. I'm not sure it would go down very well. It might cause some algorithm issues. So uh, I've decided that I'm just going to probably batch up two or three and then put them live on a separate channel. We'll see how that goes. The great thing is about this, it's like I don't, I'm don't, i not beholden to anyone, um, but I just want a record of, of that great trip. And it's just my time to get around to, to doing it and sharing it. And, uh, and obviously I'll let you know when that happens if you want to have a look at some travel stuff. I may, I've seen a few people do this on YouTube. They remaster videos. Um, now I might do that with some of them that I've got some of my older catalogue I've got like when we went to Budapest, Vienna where else did we go? Porto, Lisbon but I didn't do much video then so yeah some of our travels that we've been on before 
I may do a remastering and bring those across to the new channel. I'll see. So that was that. Um, transcripts. Now, I, I, I don't know if I've mentioned this before, but I do like to transcribe my videos. YouTube has a go at it. You may have seen them. If you happen to switch on the captions on a YouTube video, they may sometimes look a bit off because YouTube has tried to get the spelling of something maybe quite local and they've not quite got it right. Uh, so what, what I'm looking to do with my channel is to get it right, which is to use a transcriber software, some transcriber software that I have. It generates captions. I correct them, then I upload the file and that overwrites whatever YouTube does. Um, I eventually get around to it on these as well, but it takes a little while to to kind of get the time to do it. So, and I, the reason I do that is because between 22 and 25% of all of my views, so say nearly 7,100 last month, so it's quite a big number, uh, people watch with the captions on. And I think if I'm out and about and there might be a bit of noise, although I, the gear I use hopefully con contains that to a degree, uh, it's important that people get the, at least the spelling right um, it it's comes up with some weird spellings of Catrum and Waldingham and Wallingham. Wallingham is, is often the one, W-A-L-L. -L. Um, but you can literally do a search and replace thing and, and change them all. So that will be a feature going forward. And also Apple, if you on the audio version of the podcast, Apple has started to do transcriptions. And this is not just for me, this is for anyone. So if you've got podcasts that you listen to, if you wanted to actually follow along the words, you can do that. You just look on the Apple Podcast app and it has all the transcriptions. I looked to see if there was a way I could correct some of the spellings on Apple. Um, I think I have to have my podcast as a subscription podcast to do that. And I don't do that. I don't have enough people uh, follow it to make it worthwhile. And I wouldn't want to ask for people to pay money just to, um, just to get that. So uh, if you rely on the new transcriptions for my apple podcasts in audio apologies because some of the spellings may be off but if you watch it on video i would have corrected it for you so that was that uh so yes i haven't finalized my walks and talks for april um i've alluded to it a bit earlier the chelsham and waldingham sort of botley nor hill type area um, and some of that's actually on the back of comments that i've had from videos that i put up before but Sue and I went out last week on a bit of a recce. I'm going to try something here. I'm going to try something. You're ready for this. I'm going to share a screen with you. So we? there we go. Now, question for you. Can you see my screen? Because uh, I wanted to just highlight something on here. I've actually now got to go back and see if... Uh, CC on YouTube, perhaps, because some people don't... No, it can be turned off. Yeah, probably. Um, right, so that's a picture of a curtain. And I'm going to go back here. So let's get the screen up again. Now, I'm going to have to try and do some uh, movement here. Can you just give me a thumbs up or something if you can see what is a map of... So something saying rifle range in the middle. If you can just give me some kind of thumbs up acknowledgement, that'd be great. Or you can say no, nothing's changed. Because I, I don't, I kind of don't want to go any further if um, if there's nothing showing. At the moment, I've got it just showing over part of the screen. And you probably can see my chat box here. Anyone? <laughs> no, just the curtain. Oh, okay. Right. Let's go. Let's go back. Thanks for that. Um, it should be live. And a panda. Oh yeah, the panda. Sue made that. <laughs> I don't know why the camera's going up there. Right. Oh, it's probably using the webcam. Very weird. I'll tell you what. I'm going to turn that off and put my mug back on. Um, and that's something I'll have to try for the future because what I was going to demonstrate and I will, I will do this at some point is that I can share the screen, show you what's going on. But last week we went for a walk over 
Gangers Hill, Chalkpit Lane, that kind of area. Panda looks good. <laughs> yeah. Um, she, I'll tell her that. She'll be proud of that. Uh, we went for a walk. I, I, I said to Sue, let's just go out for a, a short walk. It's about a couple of miles to take an hour-ish, something like that. And she, I, I didn't give her much chance to choose. Sometimes that works best with Sue. And we headed off, parked at um, Gangers Hill Car Park and Chalkpit Lane and went off on our walk and the sun was shining and it was always fine with the world until we... Uh, hi, Julie. Julie, I'm just telling the story of how we went out for our walk in the um, with Sue last week. <laughs> so, yeah, just to recap, so we lovely sunny day. We knew that there was some rain forecast. There was a shower or two, but hey. We've got our wet weather gear if needed we've got our walking boots on sue had a pair of walking poles and we were off and it all started really well because you're heading downhill but the reason i put on screen that didn't show up was a picture of a rifle range because there is a connection a couple of generations back in my family let me get this right it was my great uncle's wife her father was the warden at Waldingham Rifle Range. And Waldingham Rifle Range was there from the late 19th century, probably until the Second World War. I think some of the Canadians that were based at Marden Lodge, um, she didn't look, not look happy. <laughs> yeah, some of the Canadians were, that were based there would have used the range for target practice. We went along there now, and really, it's kind of in the side of the hill. So we were going down this, this path, all was fine with the world, and... You just there were just the tree was just covered with uh, not densely populated but sort of sparsely planted youngish trees. Um, I mean, I don't know how long it would have lain as a kind of field before the trees started growing or whether they were planted. Don't know. We went all the way down there, all going downhill. Obviously, what goes down must come up. Actually, the climb upwards wasn't too bad. But that's when the rain came. So that was the first challenge because we had some rain and we had the climb and it was just getting muddier and muddier and muddier. And then when we got to, I think it's called Stubbs Cops up the top, it was really muddy there. Uh, and then it was Sue saying, please tell me you can see the car from where you are. So there was a slight white lie there. Um, but I said, yes, it's, I just... Just around the corner, not far, probably one or two little turns and, and we'll get there. And she did really well. She soldiered on. I'm quite used to doing these walks, uh, slipping and sliding. Um, Sue probably needs to do a few more. You know, we'll, we'll get her out for a few more. Um, but she, I think I think there's probably a reluctant, reluctant, a reluctant acceptance that she did enjoy it. But uh, we put some stuff on our Facebook um, site. So I think my, my Facebook is public if you want to have a look on there. Because um, obviously you've got to record these things, you know. Um, but it was it was uh, a, a tad amusing <laughs> to seeing her reaction. But um, I'll right, just call up my notes again. So that that was the idea. It was a recce, uh, the rifle range. I, I kind of knew that there was a family connection with Marden Lodge. Uh, it's well worth a walk there in probably better weather because it it's easy to get shelter on that walk so if you went in a burning hot summer day you could actually get quite a bit of shelter for the whole loop round i mean there wasn't much the leaves have come out in the last few days here but um it was it was a good experience i think um and really as i was going around i was thinking is there enough in here to tell a story uh i mean i could have pointed at anything and said there used to be a rifle range here but on the map there is Oh, there was, and the census shows that over a number of years, uh, Vincent Fuller was the rifle range warden, and Laura Fuller, the daughter, married Albert Carter. My mum was a Carter, Carter family, and that's that's how it joins up with the family connection. So it was an enjoyable recce. I've just now got to think, if I revisit it, how do I revisit it? Do I make a slightly different route? You did get a nice view back on the magnificent building that is Waldingham School, ex Marden Lodge. Couldn't see it too close. I had to kind of zoom in a bit with the um, with the with the phone, but uh, it's a lovely area around there. It really is. So, okay, that was that. 
Um, must work on technicals to get the map to show that on the screen, but I will. Uh, what else has been happening? I flew the drone today. Well, hey. Um, but don't get too excited. Uh, it was the first time I've flown it for months. I have mean, not really had the weather or the subject matter. Uh, I've decided to launch a project to deal with some very bad levels on the front lawn. Basically, chunks of the lawn sunk down when the Soko was put there a few years back. And I think by now it's settled. That's my excuse. Um, I'm not very good at, with a lot of things, with, with all this kind of stuff, I, I'll just do it. And I'll I'll be committed 110%, whether that's doing this, doing videos, video editing, walking, whatever, research, talks, anything. Um, but with certain things where I've got kind of perhaps a less of a committed interest, it, it's that getting yourself going to do it. Um, but now I'm committed. I've been buying tools and soil and seed and fertilizer and everything and i made a start today um but before i did that i thought the lawn doesn't look too bad when you're sideways on but if you are mowing it you realize just how uneven it is and that's when you see just how bad it is so i thought well actually if i do the and the drone wasn't flying high it's about my heights maybe less uh, but i was able to get some aerial shots a bit like before and after so i've fly the drone up again maybe a couple more times so not the most exciting drone flying experience i will add um and you do have to like a lot of these things you kind of get out of habit muscle memory of using the controls um but i will do some more drone stuff in due course so that will be good fun um actually uh ramsey who sometimes joins his calls um a good friend of mine locally He's he's got a similar drone. He's actually said to me on a couple of videos he could do some drone footage of me, so I can basically carry on walking and talking, uh, and he would fly the drone, kind of picking up some angles, which would be brilliant. So that I don't I I have some help. I have one less thing to worry about. So might see some drone action in 2024. Uh, other things that have been happening. There's still a few exciting things that have been happening. Uh, have we had the eclipse yet. Not that we can tell, not around here. Um, uh, electric car. So I've I've had a Volvo XC60 plug-in hybrid for getting on for three years. In fact, they sent a letter today, very basic letter saying, on the 10th of August, you're going to give your car back. It's going to be inspected. You might be charged, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, uh, that's no interest in offer, offering me another car. Um, so maybe it was one of the videos I did. Anyway, no. So... Uh, Sue and I went down to see the VW dealer a couple of weeks back and I like the look of the ID4 full electric and we sat in one. We didn't have time for a test drive. We didn't even arrange an appointment. So uh, looking to go for one of those in the summer, um, the reviews are, I mean, reviews are reviews, you know, generally the positives outweigh any negatives, uh, but you also get opinions from journalists that do these reviews. So but we we sat. The point is, we sat in it. It was really comfortable and spacious. The boot size is bigger than we've got in the Volvo, probably because of the battery. And um, yeah, looking forward to it. I'm, I'm quite happy to go full electric. No range anxiety here. I mean, range anxiety would only be an issue if you were if you'd badly planned a long journey. I think um, most of our journeys are local. Uh, last week. I took my first trip to the National Archives at Kew, and it was brilliant. So you have to do some prep beforehand. You have to apply for a reader's ticket. They give you a temporary ticket, and you have to set out what you want to go there and look at. So it's all done in advance. And you get, I think, a list of about 10, a maximum 10 items. Um, so... I've been doing some research into a local Selsdon resident with a good story to tell that I've mentioned on here before. And I believe now I've got the most comprehensive account of his story of his life that I'm going to get. Still still haven't got a photo, but it's a very interesting story. And I, I don't know at this stage how I'm going to share it. I still don't know. Uh, what I thought I'd do is to at least put it into PowerPoint because then I'm going to have a flow. I'm going to have a timeline. I'm going to have some physical images to to show in a in a um, on a presentation basis, and then I'll see. I mean, I could still 
turn it into a film, but we'll see. So, uh, but the actual trip was great. So you go up there and you present your ticket, um, and they say, they tell you that your the files you've requested are in a certain cupboard number. So mine was twenty two C. So I go to twenty two C, open the door, nothing. And there's an underneath bit, open the door, nothing. Went back to the desk, and they said, "Are you sure you've looked in the top and bottom?" Uh, yes. Oh, I'll, I'll go and have a look. When I had a look, nothing. Oh, I'll call the supervisor. Supervisor came and it had been moved to 23A. I mean, I didn't want to just start wandering and looking through other people's cupboards, although it's all kind of open. So got the files out, took them over. One thing I learned there is that pay very close attention when you order a record to the exact index number. An example being, I wanted to look at certificates of naturalization. So they said, well, here's the box. This has got the information you need in it. And there was a manual that thick with no index. Luckily, when I requested the record back home on the computer, it had the actual page number in the kind of URL for the site, for the, for the link, the link. So when I got the box, I was able to go to page number 165, whatever it was, and get the information that I needed. Uh, and that was a case with a couple of other records, but most of it I wanted to see was just one main file. And you can just, you know, pick up your phone, take photos. They do have these little, uh, I don't know what you call them, they're like a platform on the desk with a big kind of tall tower thing, and you can rest your phone in there. The guy next to me, he had a laptop with his phone in and a little remote control, I think it was an Android phone, and he was just... It was well well versed at this, just turning pages and clicking the clicker, and uh, taking loads of images of books and things. Um, but you're you're allowed to do it. Um, there's obviously copyright things about where you go with it, what you might do with it. But mine was to further the story. And in this particular instance, there was one document that basically told his whole life story. Uh, he was a businessman. It had. The companies he was had an interest in, what his shareholdings were, who the other shareholders were and their holdings. So it also span off some more research that I can do. Um, but yeah, I, I was glad I kind of got that done. I've got my official reader's card now, which is valid for three years. And that it's all kind of swipe card access and things like that. Very well organized. And they've got a cafe there. I mean, it's, it's quite nice to just have a wander around there. They've got a, a water feature outside. You can sit outside or inside. Uh, full kind of hot and cold food there so yeah, it was really good so it was my first visit to the National Archives pretty much all of the research I've done for all of the content and talks that I've done have been online so far so this was actually going to well some of it's been in Croydon to be fair at the, at the research room in Croydon but most of it's been online so this was a case of going to the National Archives and just seeing actual original documents signed by the actual people you've got an interest in really cool actually and while I was there I had a voicemail and when I had a moment I played said voicemail back and the gentleman said that he was uh, Hedley Beeson and Hedley Beeson is the grandson of Benjamin Beeson who I've made a film about done a talk about become very interested in his life through doing those things. We had a great conversation and a couple of follow-up conversations and emails. And we are planning to have a meet-up uh, because there is a mounted division, Metropolitan Police Mounted Division uh, Museum over in Isha. I think it's associated with the police station over there. And by appointment, you can go and visit. And the family, the Beeson family, donated medals and a number of other artefacts from his life and his career to the museum. So I'm really looking forward to going and actually seeing some of these things that I've, uh, I've actually referred to in, in the work that I've done, which is brilliant. So just the, it was weird that I've gone there to research another one of my key subjects that's really hooked me. And I get a voicemail at exactly the same time from someone else who'd been looking at video. So it was really nice. Uh, so the new talk uh, is progressing. My, I've got actually a couple, but one main one, which is the uh, the talk on my his, a historical journey from my house to wherever I'm given a talk. That's the kind of working. It's not even a title, um, but I do. I've got a number of talks planned in the area where, I mean, I can choose 
an existing subject or I want to create something new. And this is something that I can flex. So it's really looking at the history. I'm going to cater for this talk. I think I mentioned it last time. But yes, yeah, so it's the history on the main roads from here to Catrum, of which there is much and it is varied. So I'm going to be working on that. That'll just be a kind of PowerPoint style. And one thing, this is the final agenda item, pending any uh, any free format comments. Think about any comments you might want to add. Um, we went to a talk, uh, we, I went to a talk at the Bourne Society last week and it was, I want to say her name, Dr. Anne Sassin, I think her name is, and she's from Surrey Archaeology. And she was talking about a LIDAR project that they've got in Surrey. So LIDAR is light detection and ranging. It's basically, it produces a relief map of sorts. And what you do is, what you do, what happens is an aircraft or maybe a highly spec drone flies over the area that you're interested in surveying, analysing, pings sort of radio waves to the surface in in a nanosecond kind of thing and they come back and build a picture so the distance between the aircraft and the and what it hits and coming back again gives them some data so obviously if it goes into a little ridge or above a mound it's going to give you that kind of relief profile now there's various bits of algorithm and mass processing and everything that goes on but on the site that I was attempted to show you later and and I'd recommend having a look at this it's the the National Library of Scotland, so maps.nls.uk. But if you just search National Library of Scotland, you'll find them. And they do these geo-referenced maps, which is where you can look at a, a map today of an area and then choose which map you want to compare it with. And one of the options is LIDAR. And I, I used it very briefly in the Botley Hill video to illustrate where there was an enclosure, like a I think it was Bronze Age enclosure, because even if that area has got trees and a degree of vegetation on there, the accuracy of these LIDAR beams can actually penetrate through the branches of a tree. It's best done in the winter, obviously, when there are no leaves on the trees, because the beam has still got to go through and hit something to go back and do a reading. But when you looked, or when I looked at this, when I was doing the video, I could just see it was a bit like the rifle range, actually. So you can see through the area, but every metre, two, three metres, there's a tree. So, But the LIDAR was able to penetrate that, and despite there being trees, you could still make out this rectangular area from the Bronze Age enclosure. And I found that very impressive. Um, there are different uh, levels that they can go to in terms of detail. So the more dense the kind of the pinging hits are the more accurate record you're going to get like anything a bit like maps scale of maps if you if you see it like that so that was really cool and lidar is something that um it it's a very good extra particularly the fact that you can survey a wooded area and get results but they did say that you can also get in trouble a bit if you rely on that to show maybe an anomaly so they've done this project where they've been surveying chunks of Surrey and uh, Box Hill, Leith Hill, various different areas, um, National Trust areas and stuff. The problem they've had is that they found what they thought, that's a clear anom anomaly, that's a clear anomaly. And it might be a kind of rectangle, hard structure, maybe slightly raised. And they get there and it'd be a car park. <laughs> But Limsfield Chart, they did have some success there because in amongst the woodland area there at Limsfield Chart, so this is now just off the A25 near where the big grasshopper is, was, they found a regular set of rectangular anomalies. And it turns out from some physical archaeology, digging around there, looking at records, there was actually an army camp there where exercises would have been carried out. And all of those rectangular structures were Nissen huts. So it's quite a, an active and occupied camp for a while. Can't remember the name of it for a while. It, it, it escapes me. But anyway, so they said that that wasn't known until until they did that work. So um, what, what she was saying is if she had a wish list, it would be possible to do LIDAR 
plus geophysics. So geophysics is where you send a signal into the Earth. And if you get resistance, it's likely to be something physical, like a stone structure underneath a wall or, a, you know, maybe some Roman mosaics, that kind of stuff. And often when you do a whole area, you'll see kind of angles and outlines of walls. Think time team and you'll you'll remember how that was the one of the first things they did. So she said, yeah, at the moment, the, the two technologies, they're not compatible at all. One looks to bounce and get its reading. The other looks to start on the ground and go down. But she said, wouldn't it be brilliant if you could do the whole thing? You could fly over an area. Not only would it tell you what's on the surface, but it actually go beneath the surface as well. I guess we probably should say anything's possible in the future. It may be. So, um, yeah, LIDAR, it's it, it's something that's here to stay. Apparently, uh, the last few versions of the, the iPhone uh, is capable of doing LIDAR. Nothing like mapping, but if you've got the right app, I think you can use it to sort of scan objects in a room and it will create a kind of visual representation of it. Uh, I don't know how useful it is in reality. So, um, yeah. So that is where we are with my agenda for today. We've gone about the usual running time. Um, has anyone got anything that they would like to raise or ask me about? And I'd be happy to answer as I take a slurp. If not, I'll let you get back. Settle in for Mastermind. Master Master Chef. <laughs> Tipsy Elf video is really interesting. Mind boggles about what sort of underhand things went on there. Imagine Luke and drove there to fly out. Well. Yeah, I mean, wasn't... Didn't they find a car that belonged to... Was it a Corsair or something that belonged to Luke and down at... Um, Pre-prepared. Yeah. Um, yes, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, Luke and I thought I thought he drove down to New Haven, and that's when he potentially took a boat out and some concrete blocks and tied himself to I don't know. Um, the yard sale was good actually, Julie. Uh, so we had a uh, in our road yesterday. It was a it was a yard sale, and it was all for all our residents association area. And uh, yeah, loads of people came out. We had people coming from all different areas in Croydon that had seen seen it on Facebook and the like. And uh, yeah, Sue made, tax man's not watching, uh, about 80 quid. When I say made, I mean, obviously she's paid out for this stuff originally, so probably a loss. Um, but she's got cash in the hand, so that was good. Yeah, I mean, they, they. I think they might do about, the target is about three a year, something like that. So, So that was good. Car was driven to ah, uh, not necessarily by Lucan. Yes. Did I mention? I th I lose track. Right. I'm sorry. It may, must be my age. I lose track of what I've mentioned in the past. Um, but I think I did mention. May even be in the last one about the Lucan connection with one of my research subjects. But basically, a guy that I met last year was involved in powerboat racing in the sixties. And at one stage, the boat that he was in, as one of the two-man crew, were the pilots of the boat, the driver of the boat, powerboat, was Mr. Lord Lucan, 1967. So, um, which is, I mean, he was playboy lifestyle, wasn't it? I Actually, that, when I researched that story, I felt that there was perhaps a lack of people telling the tale of the nanny and the nanny's life, nanny who he murdered. And she was actually a Croydon lady. Uh, family came over, I think, from, was it Australia or somewhere? Anyway, but they lived in Croydon. Um, so that was uh, that that was something that at the time I thought, yeah, park that. It might be worth just making sure that her story is told as well. Um like I might do another little walk. This is something I spoke with Richard about when we did the Sandstead video. There's a lot of history in Sandstead because you've got where Ruth Ellis lived, which is still a private dentist on the corner of Pearly Downs Road and Sandstead Hill. Andrew Scott made that film recently that I've forgotten the name of, uh, but it 
I think it got good reviews, good made you know, won some awards about his own life, filmed in the very house that he lived in. So that's along Pearly Downs Road. I remember seeing that all with the security guys and the lighting rigs and everything when it was being filmed. Excuse me. Um, and I will mention this again on the next one. Date for the diary. I'm going to borrow a hat here. <sighs> Might have a bit of dust on it. This won't suit me. Hang on. Right. I hope you can see what that is. Mother of the Bride Crew, 23, Phuket, Thailand. So if you look up a film, there's some trailers out. There's a film called, whoops, uh, <laughs> Mother of the Bride. And um, someone who we know will be in that film. And it comes out in early May. May the 9th, I think, is it? It's the date. So uh, stay tuned. Netflix, May the 9th. Okay. Well, guys, uh, thank you very much for tuning in, listening along. Uh, always enjoy it. I've uh, I've got through quite a bit there, and um, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully you stay with me. Uh, but yes, uh, really appreciate it. Um, take care of yourselves, and uh, I'll end both versions of this now. And I'll see you, speak with you. You'll hear from me in the next one. Oops, <laughs> can't spell. University Challenge Final. Oh, brilliant. I'm still, I'm hanging on here just, just to read the comments. But yeah, um, thank you, Peace. I really appreciate that. Better than a lot of things on telly. Well, hopefully. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I hope they do get some, um, I hope they get the right result there with Sunset Library. Yeah, certainly. Cool. Okay. Right. I'll end now.